study in our series, The Perfect Man. Luke's been telling us about the perfect man, Jesus Christ. Now, if you remember from our last lesson, Jesus dealt with the Pharisees concerning the Sabbath. They were always coming up with something, wasn't they? Some type of little law, something to just really, just really bring people into bondage. And Jesus dealt with this concerning the law. If you remember, the disciples had plucked some grain and they had rubbed it in their hands and eaten it. And the Pharisees looked at this as if they was harvesting and threshing the grain. They were working. They were laboring on this day when all they were trying to do was have a little sandwich to eat, right? Just a little bite to eat. But the, the Pharisees really brought the law into this. And, uh, you know, why were they doing this on the Sabbath? That was the key thing. And Jesus had to deal with them here. Jesus dealt with them in Luke 6, verse 5, as he said to them that the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. The Son of Man is Lord of every day, and the Sabbath was included. This was a day that was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And then Jesus encountered a man in the synagogue, if you remember, with a withered hand. Of course, it seemed that he may have been planted there by the Pharisees because they were watching to see what Jesus would do. So Jesus had the man to stand up right in front of everybody. He wanted to make sure they saw what he was going to do. Jesus stood them up, and in verse 9 of Luke 6, he said, uh, Then said Jesus unto them, I will ask you one thing. Is it lawful to, on the Sabbath days to do good or to do evil, to save life or destroy it? Simple question with a simple answer, right? I mean, that should just really be a given. To do good, to save life would be the answer. I think we all would say, the Pharisees probably under the breath would say the same thing, but certainly their actions, their response to Jesus' healing didn't show that they believed that. They were mad when Jesus healed this guy, when he restored his withered hand. They were upset about it. Now, although I think that we would give the correct answer, we would say it's we're to do good, to save life. We have to think, do we have any religious practices that if somebody stepped outside the boundary of that religious doctrine, maybe that uh, ordinance or what have you, would we be upset? Maybe there are some things that, and I'm not talking about outside the word of God. We definitely want that corrected. But I'm talking about some of our religious practices. If somebody did something outside of that, would we be bothered by it? It may would demonstrate if we are that we, May would have a heart of religion more so than a heart of relationship. And that's what Jesus was demonstrating to the Pharisees. That's what he was dealing with them about was how it was important to have a relationship with Jesus and it not be just religion. It was to be a relationship. Now, after that, the 12 apostles were called, if you remember, and Jesus didn't take it lightly. He called these 12 apostles out of the disciples that followed Jesus. So there was more than just the 12 disciples. You know, he had a, a good following, following a uh, good group that was following him. But Jesus, again, didn't take it lightly. He had spent the night in prayer before he chose these 12. And then he taught a sermon that we call the Sermon on the Plain, right? A little different than the Sermon on the Mount. We know that he taught that as well. And there were similarities to these sermons. But here he was down on a plane. It was a little different account. Here he taught what is known as the Beatitudes. Again, similarities to the Sermon on the Mount. He said, blessed art thou. The Beatitudes. And he also here taught the woe unto thee as well. So Jesus taught a great sermon here. And he also taught on loving our enemies in chapter 6, if you remember. How the issue wasn't about not to judge. Remember, a lot, we've seen the scripture that so many people take out of context. Well, you shouldn't judge me because it says not to judge. But that's not at all what Jesus was saying here. What he was really saying is in whatever manner that you judge, expect to be judged in that same way. The overall idea is we should certainly want to sow grace. We should certainly want to sow forgiveness rather than judgment. We should be quick to say, I forgive you, brother. I'll look over it. And deal with it because we want, we want that in our lives as well. We want forgiveness. Now chapter 6 closed with a saying that, that you have to get to the bottom of things. We learned that by looking at a tree you can tell whether it was good or bad. You judge it by its fruit. So certainly we do judge. We judge a tree according to its fruit. We judge a person according to the way they act. How do they carry their self? And then we also saw that the foundation, it eventually shows up, right? You can have two houses that are built. They can look just alike, the same color paint, the same shutters, 
the same door trim. They can look just alike. But one of them may not have a good foundation. When is it known? When the storms come, right? That's when they're shaken. And that's when you see what truly is holding that house up. So now we get into chapter 7 tonight. And we're going to see some healings. We're going to see John the Baptist actually question whether Jesus is really the Messiah or should they look for another. We're also going to see a beautiful act of worship. True worship from a sinful woman, an unworthy woman. So let's begin in Luke 7, verse 1. Now when he had ended all his sayings in the audience of the people, he entered into Capernaum. Now this was the sayings that we just spoke of, the Sermon on the Plain here that, it, that it's speaking of. When he ended it, now he goes to his hometown where he was staying, uh, where he has kind of had set up camp, if you will. Verse 2, And the, a certain centurion servant who was dear unto him was sick and ready to die. And when he had heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying that he, this man, the centurion, was worthy for whom he should do this. For he loveth our nation, and he hath built us a synagogue. Now the centurion, this Roman soldier, the centurion being a hundred, he was over at least a hundred men here. That was kind of the idea of him being a centurion, a leader over a hundred. Of course, being a Roman also meant that he wasn't a Jew, right? He was a Gentile. And this may have, had some of the, this may have been some of the reason why he didn't want to approach Jesus himself. He felt unworthy. Now we see here that the Jewish nation, the Jewish people here, they seem to think this man was worthy, right? He was doing some good. But in the man's own eyes, he felt that he was unworthy. But look, just the fact that the centurion cared for his servant so much certainly showed something about his character. Because the Roman law said that, that if a master had a servant that was about to die sick to the point of death, that just wasn't going to do the job anymore because he was not capable, that they had the right to kill him. It was just a piece of property to him. But this man wasn't going to do it. His servant, he cared about his servant to the point that he sent for Jesus. Again, this man, man's character showed up in the fact that he did. He did for the Jews. He loved the Jewish nation. And he built them a synagogue, a place of worship. This man seemed to have a heart towards the Lord. In verse 6, Then Jesus went with them. And when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying unto him, Lord, trouble not thyself, for I am not worthy that thou should enter under my roof. Wherefore, neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee, but say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. Like the centurion, this is certainly how we should approach the Lord. We should acknowledge our unworthiness. We should acknowledge it. You see, again, the people that knew him, the Jewish people that knew him, they looked at him. They looked at him as worthy. But this man knew that he was truly not worthy. Now the centurion continued by saying, Say in a word and my servant shall be healed. Although he was unworthy, he certainly knew where to get his needs met. He knew the power of God. He had heard of Jesus. He knew that Jesus had authority. And through God's word, Jesus, it makes him worthy, right? It makes us worthy. Jesus is the only thing that makes us worthy through his blood. Now the centurion continued here or his servant did as he was, had approached, explaining his faith. He said, For I also am a man set under authority, having under me soldiers. And I say unto one, Go. And he goeth, and unto another, Come. And he cometh. And to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at them, and turned him about, and said unto the people that followed him, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And they that went, that they that were sent returning to the house found the servant whole that had been sick. Faith is pleasing to God. This man, just the fact that he believed that if God just, that Jesus just said the word, it would be done. This was faith and it was pleasing. In a sense, this unworthy centurion was worshiping in the fact that he believed. He trusted that when Jesus said the word, it would be done. Hebrews eleven six says it, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. It takes faith. Faith is an act of worship. Now we see here that this centurion, again, 
he shows the worship of the unworthy. He was worshiping the Lord in the fact that he believed God. That is always worship to our Lord when we believe and when we trust in his word. And Jesus had said, I have found so great, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. This Gentile, this Roman soldier, seemed to get Jesus' attention, didn't he? Just by simply believing. Then verse 11, And it came to pass the day after that he went into a city called Nan, and many of his disciples went with him, and much people. Now when he came nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out, and the, the only son of his mother. And she was a widow, and much people of the city was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her, and said unto her, Weep not. God, our God is a compassionate God. Just seeing this woman in pain, having lost her son and being a widow, she had nothing really after this. He had compassion on her. And it's important for us to know that he also has compassion on us. Whatever situation we're in, he sees our tears as well, just as he sees her tears and told her to weep not. He brought to this woman comfort. In verse 14, And he came and he touched the bearer, and they that bear him stood still. And he said, Young man, I say unto thee, Arise. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak, and he delivered him to his mother. And there came a fear on all, and they glorified God, saying that a great prophet is risen up among us, and that God has visited his people. And this rumor of him went forth throughout all Judea and throughout all the region round about. Now, I think we all could certainly say if we was at the funeral home and somebody spoke to the dead, hey, raise up. And he rose up and began speaking. With fear would probably fall on all of us, right? I would certainly be ready to say, you can meet me in the truck. I'll be out in the parking lot. But they knew that it was the work of God. They knew that Jesus was doing this work. And they noticed that it was not just fear. They sure, they feared, but they glorified the Lord. Now, in our lives, we may have dead spots throughout relationships in our lives maybe we have family members that uh that we haven't spoken to maybe we have loved ones that it just seems like the relationship is shot it's just gone but there's hope there's hope just as jesus just simply spoke arise to this dead man he brought the hope back into him and into his mother there was joy again he can bring dead relationships in our life back to life and also when we think of it as uh spiritual dead we may have many people in our family other loved ones that we know that they don't have life they're just like this man laying in the coffin they're spiritually dead again jesus is the one that gives that life just simply by him saying arise so we should pray for those that we love we should pray that god will speak into their lives arise just as well verse 18 and the disciples of john showed him of all these things and john calling unto him two of his disciples sent them to Jesus, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? When the men were come unto him, they said, John Baptist has sent us unto thee, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? Now John the Baptist may have thought, now he's in prison at this point, and he may have been thinking, okay, it's about time. I'm ready to be set free here. It's about time for Jesus the Messiah. He had come. It's about time for him to set up kingdom, because we know that many of the Jews felt this way. They were looking for that kingdom to come now. And so John may have very well felt this. At some degree here, he doubted. He, he wasn't sure if Jesus was really him. Or do we look for another? Art thou he that should come? Or look we for another? And so Jesus answered, uh, or here's what takes place in this same hour that John asked this question. We see in verse 21. And in that same hour, he cured many of their infirmities and plagues, and of evil spirits, and unto many that were blind he gave sight. Then Jesus answered and said unto them, Go your way, and tell John what things ye have seen and heard, how that the blind see, and the lame walk, and the leopards are cleansed, the deaf hear, and the dead are raised. To the poor the gospel is preached, and blessed is he, whosoever shall not be offended in me. Now, if we think back on chapter 4, those that was here during the teaching, uh, as we 
started uh, Luke and we went through chapter 4. Chapter 4 tells us that Jesus was handed a book, the book of Isaiah. And he stood up and he read from this book. And this is what he read. I want you to see the similarities to what he's actually doing here. Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. We heard that, didn't we? He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives. In recovering the sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and he gave it again to the minister. And he sat down. And all eyes were, were upon him. All eyes, it says, and, and the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day, this scripture fulfilled in your ears. And we see that. We see that in what Jesus was doing this very hour that John the Baptist asked, are you the one or do we look for another? This scripture in Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah had told about Jesus' coming and what would take place. And Jesus here tells him, go back, tell John what you see. Now, even though John may have had a moment of doubt, Jesus certainly loved John. And he, he thought a lot of John. And so Jesus now is not going to tell the people how sorry John is for not believing. But he's actually going to compliment John. In verse 24, And when the messengers of John were departed, he began to speak unto the people concerning John. What went ye out into the wilderness for to see? A reed shaken with the wind? But what went ye out for to see? A man clothed, clothed in white and soft raiment? Behold, they which are gorgeously apparelled and live delicately are in king's courts. But what went ye out to see? A prophet. Yea, I say unto you, and much more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall pre prepare the way before thee. For I say unto you, among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. But listen here, it says, But he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Now the people found John the Baptist very interesting in the way he was clothed and the way he carried himself and in the way that he ministered. He didn't minister like the Pharisees did, the religious leaders of the day. He was certainly different. He caught their attention. He was used by God to be the forerunner of Jesus' coming. He was used... To be the one that was sent before the Lord. Jesus said that John was much more than a prophet. Now a prophet he was. But not only a prophet. He was much more than a prophet. John was greater than all the other prophets. In the fact that he got to say he is here. Rather than he is coming. All the other prophets looked towards Jesus as coming. John the Baptist actually saw Jesus coming. He, he was able to say he is here. He was an eyewitness of this account. But he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. This refers to the fact that John, even though he was great, he was not born again under the new covenant. John was in a sense an Old Testament prophet. John was dead before the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Now Spurgeon makes this statement here. He says, as we may say as a rule, that the darkest day is lighter than the brightest night. So John, though first of his own order, is behind the last of the new, or gospel order. The least in the gospel stands on higher ground than the greatest under the law. It's amazing. That's amazing, isn't it? The, the grace that God has, us being able to believe in Jesus and what he did for us. Now, Jesus continues by saying this about John. He says, And all the people that heard him, the publicans, justified God being baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized of them. The Pharisees just would not believe this preaching of John, but neither would they believe the preaching of Jesus. Jesus now goes on to compare himself with John. Verse 31, And the Lord said, Whereunto then shall I liken the men of this generation? And to what are they? They are like unto children, sitting in the marketplace and calling one to another and saying, We have piped unto you and you have not danced. We have mourned to you and you have not wept. 
For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and you say he has a devil. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, Behold, a glutton, a gluttonous man, and a wine bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. But wisdom is justified of all her children. Now the idea here is that some is just never satisfied. You can play on the tune and you can't get them to dance. You can mourn for them and you can't get them to weep. These Pharisees, they had just made up in their mind, it seems, that they would not believe regardless. They didn't believe John and his standing and they didn't believe Jesus in the way he brought the message across either. Not only did they not believe John, but they accused him falsely of having a demon. They did the same with Jesus. They accused him as well. They accused him of being a wine bibber, a gluttonous man, a friend of publicans and sinners. Now, Jesus was certainly a friend of publicans and sinners, but he wasn't a friend in the way that the Pharisees was trying to make it. He hadn't made himself a part of them in that sense. He wasn't taking on their sins. He was there to be a witness to them. That was the mission was to be able to love the sinners. So he was certainly friends with them, but not like the Pharisees had said. Now again, it's whatsoever the Pharisees could, could do to come up with to, to not believe. It seems that that's what they would do. And people still do this today. However, we cannot believe that Jesus is the Lord. They'll come up with it. They're, they'll look for all sorts of things. But notice it says, Wisdom is justified of all her children. Basically, wisdom bears fruit, don't it? And the fruit is those that believe in Christ. It's, it's wisdom that we would believe on Him. Verse 36. And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus said it meet in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment. And stood at his feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with her tears. And did wipe them with the hairs of her head. And kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself. Now just within himself. So he's basically thinking this in his heart. He said, this man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him. For she is a sinner. And the idea here is not she's a sinner like we're all sinners, but this woman was gross in sin. Some believe that this woman may have been a prostitute. I mean, it, whatever the case was, this woman was certainly a sinner. Now, Jesus would have been reclined on the floor at this point. You know, they didn't sit at the table like we do to sit and eat. They would kind of reclined on somewhat little couches on the floor so they would lean and they would eat. So that's how he would hit his feet kind of behind him. So she would have been able to be at his feet behind him. And that's how. You know, it's uh, interesting. Have you ever heard the last words that were said at the Last Supper? Everybody get on this side of the table so we take the picture. Right? So, but it wasn't like that. It wasn't like the picture we see of the Last Supper. Jesus would have been reclining here as he ate. And so this woman began worshiping Jesus. She wept and she used her tears to wash his feet. She used her hair as well. She also kissed his feet and anointed them with this ointment that she had brought. This woman again was truly worshiping the Lord. Notice that she come into the Pharisee's house. This woman being gross and sin, this would not have been something that she would have wanted to do. She wanted to worship Jesus so bad, though she didn't let this hinder it stop her. She, she's pressed on in to worship Jesus regardless of what they thought, regardless of what might have been said about her. She wanted to worship the Lord. Are we willing to take that strong of an approach to worship our Lord? She brought this alabaster box of ointment. Now, this alabaster box would indicate, and the ointment itself would indicate that it was costly. Uh, and it was also common for the Jewish ladies in this day to wear a perfume uh, flask around their neck. It was so much a part of them that they were even able to wear it on the Sabbath day. Now, you can think they was bearing a load, wasn't they? But it was such a part of them that they were allowed to bear this load. So, in a sense, this woman give her all. She give all that she had. She really give of herself to the Lord in worship. But the Pharisee who invited Jesus, he criticized Jesus in his heart. This is what he said within himself. If he were a prophet, right? He would know who and what manner of woman 
this is. But Jesus knew. He knew exactly how she was. And he knew exactly what this Pharisee was thinking. He knew. He also knew that he was receiving here the worship of the unworthy. This woman was unworthy, but she worshiped the Lord. In verse 40, And Jesus answering, said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he saith, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. And one owed five hundred pences and another fifty. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. Now it was clear to Simon, right? Uh, he, even though he said, I suppose, it seemed that he paused here in his response. But it was certainly clear that the one that was forgiven the most would seem to love the most. Now Jesus turns and he makes it a little bit more personal than just a kind of a vague story like this. In verse 44, he turns now to the woman and he said unto Simon, Seeth thou this woman? I entered into thine house, Simon's house, and thou gavest me no water for my feet. But she has washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman since the time I came in has not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint but this woman has anointed my feet with ointment wherefore i say unto the the her sins which are many are forgiven for she loved much but to whom little is forgiven the same loveth little and he said unto her thy sins are forgiven now it's important to notice here this woman wasn't forgiven because she loved much she loved much because she was forgiven and it's important for us to remember that, that, that we too have been forgiven. You know, I think sometimes as Christians, we get used to walking our regular Christian walk throughout the day. And sometimes we may forget that we've sinned before, that we have sinned that in the past. Hopefully, hopefully we're not currently in sin, but even if we are, that God can forgive us and he wants to forgive us. So it's important for us to always keep that in mind that, that although we're worthy, although we're Christians, we can call ourselves saints because we've been covered under the blood. There's still that side of us that we've been forgiven, that we were sinners, but now we're cleansed. Now, when we think of what what he has done for redeeming us, it should stir in our hearts just like it did this woman. When we realize the sins that we had done and just the fact that we were born into sin, that we was going to have hell to pay without Jesus it should create in us a desire to worship God just like this woman with all our heart soul mind and strength we should want to worship him true worship should spring forth from our hearts now regardless to whether we seem to have a lot of sin or a little sin it should still create a heart of worship because regardless we've sinned the last few verses here it says and they that said it meet with him begin to say with within themselves who is this that forgives sin also and he said to the woman thy faith has saved thee go in peace jesus forgives this woman and her faith has saved her now he tells her to go in peace probably she didn't want to get up and leave she was enjoying her time of worship so rather than just go he told her go in peace she has this peace now that she was saved so what we have, what what have we been forgiven for? Again, whether whether we've been a hardcore sinner and done this or that, seems like we've just been at the very bottom, or whether we've been in church all of our lives and feel like maybe we ain't done too much bad, we have still sinned, and it's important for us to know that, even if it's in our mind. Remember, Jesus deals real strictly with that. That even if you think uh, think of lust towards a woman or a man, if it be that you've committed adultery. Even if you think of how you hate your brother, you've committed murder. So maybe we think, well, you know, I haven't done that much. Was, is my love not going to be much? Well, you've probably done more than you think. So it's, again, always, it, God don't remind us of that sin, but we should certainly remember that we have sinned and that he loves us and that he forgave us. Jesus wants to say to us as well, thy faith has saved thee. Go in peace. Jesus wants to see with us what he sees with this woman, the worship of the unworthy. So let us pray. 
Father, we thank you, God, that uh, that we can come before you and just worship you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, Lord God. Father, we want to give you the type of worship that you really desire, Lord, that our focus will be on you when we come in this place, Lord, and our desire will be to reach out and to touch you, Father, and to forget about the things that are around us as this woman had pay, seemed to pay no mind to the Pharisee in the house, Lord. Father, we thank you that you would desire that type of worship from us and we want to give it, Lord. Father, we pray that you continue to grow us in that. Continue to show us how much we need you because we certainly do, Lord. Father, we ask it as we go now, Lord, through the rest of this week, that you'll stir that heart of worship in us, that, that God, you'll just guide us and lead us in the ways that you'd help us to go. And that in our actions, we'll worship you. In song, we'll worship you. Father, we'll worship you with the whole of our life. In Jesus' name, amen.